Welcome to episode four of the Listen In With The Youth Council podcast. Um, This is the final episode of series one. And today we are delighted to be joined by Daniel and Holly from the Football Versus Homophobia Youth Panel. And um, I also want to thank the Hereford Traffic Youth Council for again coming in to um, take part in this. What does sexuality mean to you? Sexuality to me is everything of who you are. It's your, it's the way you're born. It's the way your sexuality defines the way you you dress, the way you express yourself. Um, and it's you're going to carry your sexuality all through your life, um, the, even if you don't like it. You, you're gonna, you are who you are. You can't change. I don't believe you can change your sexuality. I know there's this whole stuff about oh, you can like convert, like Jimmy can get, you know, conversion therapy and stuff like that. I don't believe that's effective. I think that causes sort of more damage to people um, and it's all myth in my opinion um, and sexuality yeah sexuality to me is just it's it's a journey as well because when you know it's for me when I noticed well when I realized I was gay during um, my teenage years it's the journey of how you want to come out as well it's a ju- it's the journey of who do you tell first um, do you go do you confide in your parents or do you go to your friends first there's a lot of different complications when it comes to, comes to um, Def- like defining your sexuality and being open about it so for me sexuality is you is is, is everyone it, it mm-hmm. is it's a term that's obviously has loads of different um sexuality uh different sexualities attached to it but obviously to yourself it, you've got your own unique sex- sexuality which defines yourself it couldn't put it any better really um just why i let daniel go first <laughs> um <laughs> i think something that is important that like we sort of touched on about it being a journey is that it's it's fluid and I think it's something that doesn't have to always be labelled and I think it's something that's like like Daniel said it's something that like can it can change but not in the sense of if someone's making you change it if that makes sense it can change just from your own sort of personal um journey I suppose and I think I think there's different ways of looking at it and there's different theories behind it but I think it just comes down to basically um the right to to sort of be with whoever you want really I think that's the biggest mm. thing it's who you are and it, you, you should do whatever ever makes you happy mm. like don't be judged by what other people say because if you get judged yeah. or bullied they're not if ever bullies you they got something wrong mm. be be happy who you are and be with ever who you want and then make you more happy really I agree with what Dan said and the guest Daniel as well so sexuality is whatever you want to be whatever you want to come out as basically has football the homophobia month of action helped to educate young people about sexuality 100% with the um, football West homophobia month of action it uh, the fact that we have a month of action means that people who are already out and proud of who they are and they know who they are they're not confused anymore. They're sharing their stories, and also uh, those stories include like personal journeys. And I think a lot of people who look at the content that was produced uh, throughout the Football vs Homophobia Month of Action will see that obviously everyone has their own specific journey, but there are similarities between. Um, there's obviously like there's a lot of common themes. Usually, a lot of say some people when when they're in the closet at, at school and um, earlier on in life they they experience bullying and a lot of the times um people who are in the closet are are there because of bullying and the sort of pressure that pressures around the sort of coming out in that sort of school environment um and obviously when you hear a lot of sort of big names not not obviously like i've seen a lot of support obviously from football clubs during the month of action also from ex-players and fans when you when you get all those stories and you can hear what people are saying a lot of people who are who obviously who might not understand sexuality or who are still figuring figuring out their own sexuality can have a clearer picture about well what it means to um be who you are um and i think the month of action really really is massive because i think without it i don't think we'd have enough sort of said about you know the stories within football and um lgbtq plus people because unfortunately that there aren't any 
Uh, well, there are and in lower leagues, but obviously in the top four flights of English football and the men's side of the things, you don't have any sort of gay or gay, lesbian, transgender players. You're like you don't have that sort of representation. So um, I guess the month of action allows, you know, lower like people from lower leagues and different organisations around football to sort of, you know, talk about these important subjects and talk about these important important issues around sexuality. And, and it's and like you said, Cam, it's not we're we're part of the um, youth panel but we, we're learning every we're learning so many new things um yeah different different stories and everything like that so even from for myself you and holly we're 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 not you know we don't know we don't know everyone's story so we're still listening and still reading a lot of different things and it's helping to it's helping us to get a better picture of um you know certain certain issues around uh, lgbtq plus inclusivity and represent representation in football i think um it was great to see so many different, such such sort of diverse groups of people involved as well, um, mm. because I think that's the most important thing is that people if can see someone they can relate to in these sort of events and these sort of activities yeah. and think, oh, well, they've done it so I can do it and have those role models. Um, and yeah, I think it was a great thing to be part of. Um, it was definitely sort of looking back on the month and just the amount of, of events we ran as the youth panel and then as the, the main campaign as well. I think it was just yeah. like... For me, I think everyone could look back and be really proud of themselves. And I think um, it was great to see so many young people involved who potentially might not have sort of discussed those issues much before. And it was, I think we talked about this sort of um, in the gender podcast about how education just starts at an early age and the earlier you can sort of access people and um, make sure they don't sort of develop those discriminatory views. Like, I think the better because younger people are just more open minded usually and, and tolerant. Okay, thank you very much. So, Ethan, this I've now got a question for you. Okay. Um, go for it. What did you know about the football versus homophobia campaign in general and the month of action prior to running your event as part of our youth panel event? I'm going to be honest here, right? I didn't know anything, but by the end of it, I learned twice as much as I did starting it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Why in 2021 is there still a need to announce you have come out? I think it's like, um, like if you can, I think it shows like courage, like like because you've got so many discrimination coming from at all all borders. I think if you if you could come out and feel happy about yourself, then you might be able to inspire somebody else who, who's who's frightened too. So I think mm. it's all about inspiring, as Holly said, education as well. Make yourself a more happier person. If you're if you're happy about coming out, then you should be. You should. No one should be be able to stop you being happy at all. So I think it, it's a tricky one because I don't think anyone has to. Um, and it, I think similar to what Daniel was saying before, it's a bit of a journey. And I think as you progress throughout life. LGBT plus people are always coming out to new people and it's it's a constant thing that you you know you're never out to everyone um but I think I think it's just in the sense of um for example if if someone who's in a position of like power or influence like celebrities and stuff do that I think it's representation I think that's why it's important in some ways um and like Dan said it's quite a brave thing to do to to sort of risk people sort of turning against you and not accepting who you are so I think it's as much as I don't think anyone should feel pressured to to do that and it, it's something for people to do in their own time I think the more people that do it just just create that representation and those role models and make it more visible in, within society and therefore more accepted I think. I agree with everything you guys have all said um, but obviously the reason for me I feel like you have to announce you like you're coming out as who you are mm -hmm. as an LGBTQ plus person because unfortunately it's still not normalized um, even normalized to be you know LGBTQ plus in this country I mean obviously we're in a we're in a lucky situation in England where, you know, things are improving and we're, you know, what I mean, the campaigning's going well for LGBTQ plus rights in all sort of um, aspects and walks of life. But you have to just look at outside of England and all over the world. We've got, obviously, we've got some better progressive countries. I mean, Portugal and the likes of Portugal and Sweden. I know they're two places where it's best, like the best sort of places for LGBTQ people to be accepted and live. Um, and then you've got countries, you know, in, in Africa and, you know, certain parts of Eastern Europe where it's still illegal. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to get to a time where homosexuality is going to be 
as normalized as being heterosexual um i've always asked this question i think i think i listened i think i heard it in a film like why do straight people not have to announce they're straight and why is it only you know lgbtq yeah. plus people who have to announce they're either gay bi you know i mean lesbian is and it's all because of just culture um culture and the way it's been passed on throughout the years and like we're, we're progressing we're, we're always we're obviously gonna like you know get it's going to be better to be lgbtq plus in like the future still because obviously you know society's developing everything's developing views and attitudes amongst younger generations are getting better but like holly said a lot of it is to do with education and until until we get the sort of you know minority of people who are still against our community until they sort of you know in the nicest way possible die out um, and we have the new generation come through then you know what i mean there'll be obviously the situation will be will be better for sort of um lgbtq plus people to live in um but it's always i feel what i feel like to summarize we're always going to be in a position where you know um as like you don't have to come out but i think you just come out to people just so people can know and they they, they, they know that like you're out you're you know who you are now so you don't have to you know like act differently around anyone so it's it's just a reassurance especially well for myself i announced it to all my friends because i wanted them to know who i really was um and I, and I was ready to share that story so um but yeah i don't think we're ever going to get to the point where you know we, we like where people know who are in our community can just like you know go about life and not announce it and mm. it's always going to be a case of you're gonna have to announce it so people are aware um so that, that's my opinion on the, on the matter as a young person how do you feel talking about sexuality generally I feel a bit like nervous and anxious to feel to talk about it because it's not really a topic that I would talk about every day. If that makes sense. And that's a natural reaction. Can I just add? That's yeah. a natural reaction for a lot of you know um, heterosexual people and allies. You don't want to get anything wrong. You don't. You don't want to misgender someone. You don't want to say yeah. something wrong that might offend someone. So yeah, I that's understand. what I don't want to do. So a lot of my friends, yeah, as I say, a lot of my friends are like that still, and I'm. I'm always telling them to chill out. You can make mistakes around me. I'm not going to, you know, crucify someone for, you know, <laughs> saying something wrong or just educate them. That's the whole point is education. I think, like, um, going in, going to a football first homophobia, like, workshops that Cam to invite me along to, it was a real, real eye-opener. I learned quite a lot from it. But I, I feel comfortable to talk about the subject. I find once you learn more, it, you can sort of, like, um, like, be more open if you know what I mean. Why is women's football more open about sexuality compared to the men's game? I think it's something that I think is often just seen as that it's not an issue um, at all in the women's game, which it can in terms of sort of discrimination on the basis of um, how you identify. And it can be, but it's definitely much better. Um, and I think I think it's just a case of the sort of hyper masculine environment of football that men who are involved in football are expected to behave a certain way and like uh, DK said like socialization in terms of just behaving as like men should behave and then obviously part of that is being sort of heterosexual so I think I think it all comes down to culture within the game um, and I think it's sort of the opposite in the women's game where it's almost like seen as if you're a bit more sort of, I don't, to, I don't have to say it really, like if if you're a little bit more of like, display more sort of masculine traits, that's a good thing. Whereas in the men's game, if you display any sort of feminine traits, then it's instantly sort of seen as being like gay, which might not be the case. And even so, like it should be, should be absolutely fine. So I think, I think it is just a big cultural thing. I think it's, it goes past playing and into like fan culture and that sort of thing, which is something we've discussed a lot with, um, the youth panel around like certain chants and certain songs that are sang at games that just feed into that that homophobic culture um so yeah I think it's I think it just goes back a long time and and the women's game as a whole has always seems to be a little bit more inclusive um mm. and then the men's game is is pretty sort of um in this culture of white straight men a lot of the time I think in terms of fans um so I think yeah there's a lot of work to be done I think in the men's game I think you said everything right there Holly um I think one thing I just want to add is the fact that the women's game's a newer inst institution compared to the men's 
So it's not had to, you know, tackle hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, deep rooted homophobia within fan culture and within structural culture within the men's game. So the fact that the women's game is more newer and, and it just means it's easier in terms of the fact that it doesn't have to sort of battle the, the sort of cultural battles that exist within the men's game still. So the women's game sort of started with a clean slate. And, and I think a big sort of example of that is just the amount of role models at the top of the women's game who are openly LGBTQ. I'll get, name you a few. You've got, you've got the likes of Vivian Miedema, Sam Kerr, Megan Rapino. All these people are amazing footballers and they're just role models to everyone. And, and I, I'm working within women's football at the moment. So I'm working for, I think Holly said about um, grassroots level, I'm working at Cheltenham Town Ladies who are not in the top two divisions of um, women's football. And as a sort of open, openly gay man who attends all their games, I feel a, a lot more accepted within the women's football environment. I feel like it's that half the players anyway, at least half the players are um, open about their sexuality and are LGBTQ+. plus. So they embrace the difference. I think that's the key difference. In a women's game, you embrace the sort of being different and like you 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 sort of don't joke about it, but you know, you, you sort of embrace it and like it's something that you guys can like you can just like have a laugh about. But within the men's game, if like Holly said, if, if something's different or someone's, you know, got a feminine haircut or someone wears something that looks a bit, you know, flamboyant, then you're getting, you know, you're getting stared at, you're getting um ridiculed, you're getting chants made about you. And that and that's and that's all due to for me, I think it's to toxic masculinity masculinity and what being a man is def being defined as, unfortunately, over the years, it's been about, oh, you need to be macho, you need to man up, you need to not show any emotion. And the re reality is that, that 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 sort of definition of what being a man is, is so toxic. And and that's the reason why you see, you know, a lot of suicide rates amongst among men being so high is because, you know, like, you're being taught a lot of like men are being taught this and the fact that they, they don't feel like they can open up about their emotions it's almost like you're you know it's almost like you can't you've got nowhere to go if you're struggling with like depression and i mean i'm, I'm now going to off track it but what i'm saying is obviously culture within the men's game is just so it needs a reboot like and, and i don't know how it's going to happen um i think for me obviously with, with the women's game you've got no problem because you've got so many players who are coming through who are openly LGBTQ+, plus, but I've discussed it before for my final year projects, I'm doing it all about LGBTQ+, plus representation in the men's game. I feel like you'll need a group of sort of players to come out at the same time to sort of share the bud burden, and that will inadvertently help change attitudes around, you know, agents, fans, um, everything really. So yeah, the women's game for me is much more, you know, people can be open about who they are because you know that you're not going to get you know the slack that comes from um you know from what what happens in the men's game if anything i think a lot of women um find like a lot of lgbt women find like their place in women's football almost mm. um i think it, it's almost like a natural place for, for people to meet and people to like come together and have that safe space to be you know who they want um and yeah it's been interesting sort of working in a football club as well and, and seeing that it is it, like in some aspects can still be quite a masculine environment um but also that people are also accepted so it, it's a tricky one I think I think we're at a bit of a transitional period where we're making progress but then you've just got those people who are quite traditional about football and and who should be involved and in sort of gatekeeping aspects of it so I think it, we're getting there I think it's just going to be a bit of a slow a slow burner and can I just quickly okay. add, uh, one thing I just thought about now is, you know what I mean, it's it's more, I know it's controversial, this is quite controversial, but it's more, it's normalised more for women to be lesbians compared to men being gay. Um, and I think that's what's helped, obviously, with, you know, the women's game being a bit more inclusive, is because that stereotype of, it's all right, like, a lot of men see that, like, they, I've, I've heard people say that to me, like, oh, you know, being, like, I've seen it online, like, people saying, oh, it's fine for lesbians to be lesbians, but, but for gay men, it's not. And I don't, I don't really get that. And again, that that comes from, you know, socialization and like what you learn from a young age and what you're taught. And that, that's what I'm saying. All that sort of culture has to change. And and if that does change, I feel like we'll we'll get to a point with the new generation where the women's game and the men's game will be the same when it comes to sort of LGBTQ plus representation and inclusivity at the highest at the higher levels and all through the grassroots as well. When we did those um, videos as part of the month of action, 
where we got given a load of words and had to basically react to them. I believe that that was really good because not just because I did. I was in a group with DK and Holly, so it was it was a really decent conversation. But <laughs> we also um, it also allowed me to kind of understand what goes on in football in terms of when fans are fans are allowed to go into stadiums and they do shout whatever they shout. And um, it does happen. A story that Sam from Villa and Proud told me, and he was basically saying that he's been at football matches um, where he's been in the stand supporting the team and um, he he's turned around to somebody because they've been shouting something that could be classed as homophobic. We as young people have the ability to challenge any homophobia, any homophobia when we are allowed to go back to football matches because I'm sure that we've all heard something when we've been at football matches, whether it's yeah. at the very highest level or at the um, or in the lower leagues. Mm, I have as well. So it's it. I've w- I've witnessed like loads and loads and loads. Why would you have to do that? It's in my eyes, it's causing trouble for you, for them to get kicked out and mm-hmm. more pressure on the club. If that makes sense. I've been up to, I've been to the I've been to see Premiership matches to the very lowest leagues, and I've sit like I've heard racial slurs of discrimination at all. And I, I just, what Ethan says it it's for getting kicked out, but also you can, you can guarantee if someone says a slur at a match, it, it carries on to social media. Mm-hmm. And social media can be one big poison. Poison. Sometimes it can be used for good to, to share awareness up, but sometimes it can be used for like a poisonous thing. As long as you educate it and stamp it out now, is what Cam said. Challenge it. Challenge it from the word go. You can guarantee it will become less and less. What were you taught at school or college about sexuality? I can't remember. <laughs> Honestly, I can't. <laughs> can I can I answer this? Go, Go for it. it. One word, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Exactly. Nothing. exactly. I'm not even lying. This is literally. this is just the reality of it. It that was, was just, literally that was the same thing as me. Yeah, like literally nothing. Even if you experienced this, Ethan, but like you sort of you sort of just assume that there's like from the the fact that it's never spoken about, you just assume like oh everyone's heterosexual because like. Yeah it's never <laughs> spoken about like it's like re like lessons like re when you talk about marriage and it's always men and women men and women who like are in the textbooks and pictures of that um sex with like even like sex education is all about man, men and women you know and i mean it's it's you're not you're not so taught you anything and obviously you don't, you don't hear any different do you no like, you don't like in the school environment because they don't bother teaching you it and that's why you get so many sort of I was going to say, sorry, Ethan, that's why you get so many people within right. school environments using terms loosely, like, which are very yeah. offensive, like, to mm-hmm. certain people who they might not know are in the closet, and, and it affects them even more. It is getting better, because I know, so the school I went to, like I said, I don't remember ever learning about it. It wasn't spoken about. There was very, very few people who were sort of out in school. Um, and then I went back to work at my old school, basically, and they had made some big steps. So they had like a pride club. So that was like for young people to go to who were questioning or who. And that was all the teachers who ran that were LGBT. Um, and that that was really successful. Um, like a lot of teachers wore um, pride lanyards to either show that they were an ally or um, LGBT plus. So I think schools are... I have noticed that it's probably affecting their young people's mental health and that sort of thing. And I think they're trying to take steps to improve. But I think that's on a school by school basis. I think it can. One of my friends said she went to a Catholic school and they weren't taught about it. Um, they, or they were taught that it was it was wrong, essentially. Um, and this is this is, in, you know, in recent history. And um, that's understandable if that's what the faith, you know, says. But it's almost like it should be a more neutral view, at least um, not a negative teaching someone that it's negative because you're then essentially teaching someone that their their identity is invalid and that it shouldn't you know they shouldn't be able to do that so I think I know I know a lot of people that I know um didn't sort of come to terms or even realize until they went to university and they found that a much more accepting space um and I think that that's quite worrying in a sense that because obviously if you're getting to 18 19 20 then that shows mm. that there's a lot of factors in your early education years that have really sort of stopped you from 
being yourself and from sort of going on that journey so um yeah I, I hope from from sort of anecdotal experiences that schools are doing more but obviously it's going to be very much on a sort of individual basis what the schools want to do my mum's a teacher at, um at a, at a secretary school and she's sort of said to me recently that there are more there are there are, there are starting to become more like I know it's not a lot but there are more individuals who are open about their sexuality at secondary school now um and and it's starting to become you know more sort of normalized I, I feel like when I was there when I before I left there was like one guy in my year who was like openly sort of gay and he was always like he was always like the gossip of this like when he sort of came out everyone was like oh my god like what does this mean like uh, what's he gonna do it, it, Jamie, it's almost like it's, they didn't have a clue so many questions come around mm -hmm. from someone just being who they are whilst if this is taught in certain lessons then people won't have those questions and that's mm -hmm. that's the problem the fact that these a lot of schools are not teaching you know basic lgbt education it's, it's leaving so many questions for like heterosexual people being like well what does this mean how do they do stuff how how does this happen and it's that, that's the problem unless you get this education in then it's going to become more of a well the more education you have in about you know lgbt sort of the basics to, to do around being lgbt then that's when you know less awkward questions will be asked by people who are who who, mm. who ask these questions because they want to learn and at the end of the day they're not they're not being taught by um they're not being taught by a lot of them are not being taught by parents or schools so they're asking directly to people and it might come across offensive to some because they'd be like well hang on why are you asking this so schools have a big responsibility to, responsibility to play in the future yeah. but, you know. in the future because when i was at secondary school i didn't experience any like LGBT teaching or knowledge I didn't know anything till like college and I was like how have I only known this now I agree with you Ethan because like um, me and Cam went to the same secretary school we didn't learn anything did we when we were at school it's like being back in the Victorian ages like uh like schools <laughs> that old. I, I feel like it Cam I'm 24 <laughs> What steps would you like to see schools and colleges take when talking about sexuality? I would like them to be able to like have a workshop or have like a session once a week or twice a week just to make them aware of they can get someone for them to go and speak to. I think it needs to start earlier to to be honest I think it can start in primary school I think it's not I think I, I don't always like the term sex education I think it's relationship education and oh you're teaching people at, at that stage in primary school I know there's a big campaign called no outsiders um which has looked to, to focus on this and it's sort of through stories and telling stories about different types of families you know this person's got two mums this person's got two dads um and it's almost like normalizing it like, Dan, like DK said in terms of as a societal thing and then once you move on to you know secondary school and then people are going through puberty and stuff that's when you can maybe go on to the more like inclusive sex education side of it um but I think it's just about embedding it in into the curriculum as well like in history why can't you have a lesson on LGBT history or why can't you have a lesson on even just things as simple as people not understanding understanding like gender and sex and that sort of thing like the difference between those concepts and I think it can be embedded in across the curriculum and, and then it will just become a lot more spoken about and a lot more um, normalised. Would your attitude change towards a teammate, friend or family member if they came out as gay or bisexual? Not at all. I would treat them the same. Say if I was joining a football club, for example, and I found that they were gay in the first two weeks, that... It wouldn't change how I treat them. I would treat them as, as, as like I would with every other every person in that team. I wouldn't treat them any differently. I agree with Ethan. I mean, to be fair, if if the situation was with me, then I'd probably just be a bit more. I'd care more. Like I'd want I'd want to protect like my mum or brother mm -hmm. from the mean outside world that exists. I'd be a bit more a bit more overprotective in terms of trying to make sure that they're okay asking you know whatever they just being a bit more you know just un, not understanding but just offering a hand if they ever need help or in any mm -hmm. any sort of sense or because I know the sort of problems that I've gone through mental health wise with the whole sort of 
coming out journey so I guess it's just about you know showing your support and reaching out and just showing that like you know just being very, very overprotective in that sense I think like like DK said just if anything your attitude should be more to, to sort of um support them and, and ask what they need in terms of um you know any help or just you know an arm on the shoulder to say like you know we we support you and we don't see you any differently I'll, su- I'll support them well, whatever like um like they'll always be my best mate and um i'll never judge them they'll always be a yeah. best mate were you nervous when you told your family and friends you were gay well mine's my situation's a bit is different because it's, it's difficult it, well, it's different to a lot of people because my family's like split in terms of religion so i've got my mum's side of the family are more Catholic and my dad's side of the family are more, um, they're, they're Muslim. So I know there's, there's differences in terms of how, I knew there would be differences in terms of how they react. I knew my mum would be, you know, straight away accepting and just, and and because I'm half Irish, my Irish side of the family loved it. Like they were like, yes, finally, we know, you finally found who you are, <laughs> like sort of thing. And then, and then I, I knew with my dad's side of the family, it's going to be a, bit, a lot more difficult because it's still very, you know, um, well in a lot of countries that um are of islamic faith it's still illegal to be you know gay um so i knew i, I knew it'd be tougher so obviously when i did come out to my dad i, did, I didn't expect like you know a hug or whatever saying like, i'm proud of you i didn't i got a, i got a bit of a silent treatment for a bit um but he came like he came around he came around to it quite soon after i sort of like you know confided in him more and just sort of told him more about you know my growing up and how you know just opening up a bit more so yeah it's 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 very different it's very it's very difficult because I knew there would be different reactions and it it's sort of like it always played on my mind like should I do it because it means you know I might get a cold shoulder from one side of the family but I might get loved by another and that's what that's what's happened and at the end of the day both sides of my family are now okay and it, it's taken time for one side of it to accept it more than the other um so obviously my situation is quite unique but yeah like at the same time it's you know that it's the way that's the way it is you're going to have some people who are you know going to be a bit more open about it at the start and some people who are going to take a bit of time to sort of adjust to the change that that happens within you know within yourself does it matter what sexuality you are no um i think one of my favourite expressions, it's, it's very cliche, is just that love is love. And, like, it's not something that you can pick and choose. And, like, at the end of the day, like, it's something that you're born with. And if, you know, the, the better place society is for people to, to be accepted, then the more likely they are to accept themselves. So, but the short answer is no, it shouldn't matter. Like, you know, people should have the right to, to love who they want and be with who they want. So... Hopefully we'll get to a point where that's the case um, everywhere, but time will tell. It really doesn't matter. Like I don't really care who you are. You could be wh- whatever you want. At the end of the day, you got one life. Make it count. Live it to the fullest. Like you don't want to. You don't want to get to an age where you know you wish you could have come out earlier and lived life a bit more. Uh, you know, to the fullest of of your capabilities. So um, I don't really care what. Like it doesn't define. Well, it does define who you are. Like it is who you are, but it doesn't doesn't make me look at anyone differently like I look at everyone the same regardless of whatever and you're born that way as Lady Gaga would say so you know embrace it embrace Mm -hmm. it I agree with what Holly and DK says it it's who you are love yourself you get one life make the most of it has the rainbow laces campaign had an effect since it started in 2013 well I've actually got well, I've got direct experience with working with a football club on the Rainbow Laces coverage um, more recent. So obviously that I worked with um, Cheltenham Town and sort of uh, like evolving their Rainbow Laces coverage. And I did a, I did multiple features ex, uh, sort of exploring different stories from fans, from players. I spoke to players and, and the manager about, you know, certain issues within like with, with to do with LGBTQ plus inclusivity and representation. Also, a lot, well, I also spoke to a fan as well who 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 want he wanted to have an lgbtq plus fan group um at cheltenham town because obviously a lot of clubs now they have their so sort of like own affiliated fan groups and obviously it was a great campaign for in terms of um producing content and getting our name out there for cheltenham in terms of like showing that we are lgbtq plus inclusive and um representative representative of 
you know, um, diversity. Um, and as, as a result of the campaign, of the last campaign that we just had, um, the club are now in talks to set up an LGBTQ plus fan group for Cheltenham fans. So it just shows you the power of what, you know, these campaigns can have. It leads to positive change. And I'm so proud to sort of spearhead Cheltenham's coverage and sort of make positive changes to the way they sort of um, t looked at these issues and the way they covered it. And the fact that now, as a result, I've made a difference to so many people's lives in terms of Cheltenham, fan, Cheltenham Town fans, because I've sort of spearheaded the sort of argument for there should be an LGBTQ plus fan group. And the fact that they're now in talks with their Football Supporters Association to get the funding for that, it makes me really proud. And, and every year the Rainbow Laces campaign is evolving and it's had a massive effect, in my opinion, on football, especially because I've worked with, with uh, I've worked alongside the campaign for a football club. So I feel like I know quite a bit about it now. I was just going to say, it's great to hear like an anecdotal story of how, how successful it can be and what can happen. Because I think my concern sometimes with campaigns is is them being a little bit tokenistic and it's like well we have one day a year where we do this and we wear these laces and then everything's solved and there's nothing around it but it's nice to hear actual stories and I think I think it's up to clubs to sort of use the campaign and not just sort of do the bare minimum and to do some awareness around it with fans and that sort of thing and some education um but yeah I think just having that visibility just for like young fans who are sort of questioning potentially and just seeing their like role models with the, the rainbow laces and the armbands, that must be like huge. So I think it, it is positive. And I think as long as it has the sort of um, plans and, and strategies to back it up to actually sort of measure the impact and that sort of thing, I think it's, it's a great um, sort of event really. Yeah. Like I was going to say, um, as a result of like, you know, f uh, players and managers sort of giving their support to the community in, in terms of from the Cheltenham side of thing. If you're a Cheltenham, if you're a young Cheltenham Town fan and you're like, oh, how am I going to be accepted within the football environment? Well, you've got examples here of a manager and two, two like big players within the club sort of supporting and showing their support for the community. So like Holly said, just seeing that is like, it changes a lot of people's sort of lives in the for the better. If you've been affected by anything talked about on the podcast, then go onto our website at www.herryfisherfa.com for more information. So, that was episode four, the final episode of series one of the Listen In With The Youth Council podcast. Thank you ever so much to the Herefordshire FA Youth Council and to our guests from the Football Versus Homophobia Youth Panel, Daniel and Holly. 